second and final of our celebrity interviews, a uh, very successful forum for uh, introducing to you to some of the legends of the music business here at Canadian Music Week. So I'm not going to do a long introduction. Ed doesn't want one. Ladies and gentlemen, Ed Bicknell. Yes, we're on here. Let me first say, this is rather curious for me because we've been very, very old. Yeah. So let's stop now, Peter and Lee. <laughs> Here he is, Kojak. Right. The show that he is. <laughs> Welcome to this lush, plush, but not yet paid for emporium. <laughs> <laughs> Peter has been a very, very close friend of mine for some years. He's been incredibly supportive to me. I do consider him to be one of the truly great, great managers in our business. Um, and would you please... Thank you. God, they've turned that bloody Zeppelin record off. <laughs> now! <laughs> it's alright, Dennis, there's a chair there for you. There you go, Dennis. You can rent that for five dollars. Um, and we'll start off with a different subject to what probably everybody expects. You're one of the very few people I know who actually met and knew Elvis Presley. Yes. And the Colonel. Are we going to start on a phone? Let's start with that one, piece. Start with a phone part. Yes. So, off yeah, you I was fortunate to see uh, Elvis on uh, several occasions, and uh, uh, the members of Led Zeppelin and myself were invited to uh, one of his concerts in uh, 1976 at the Forum in LA. And what happened during the concert was probably that the only thing you that are managers in, uh, in this audience will, I think, uh, you know, when you're something really gay, great that really gets you here. And we were about, I suppose, ten to dozen rows from the front, and he was about a third of the way through the show, and it was really rough. He had a big orchestra and a James Burton and a big orchestra and the singers and all that, and it, it was really shaky. And Elvis went suddenly he went stop, 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 and he stopped them and he said, "Ladies and gentlemen," he said, "We're going to start this number over again." He said, "Because we've got Led Zeppelin sitting in the audience." And we want to look like we know what we're doing up here. <laughs> I just went, I went cold. But uh, the evening did actually got better. We were, we were invited back to the suite at the Intercontinental Hotel. And Jerry Weintop and uh, Tom Healy said, you see a 20 minute audience. And we went up and we met him and we were sitting talking. And um, I suffer from a compact lower disc. And it's kind of hard Compact to say this. it's wrong. <laughs> 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 I said to Ronnie, and the person let out a big yell, and I looked around and it was Elvis's father, Vern. <laughs> and I nearly died. I'm there, I'm sitting on Elvis's father. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to him, well, I said, Mr. Preston, if you had to be anybody who's going to sit only in this room, it might as well be me. I didn't have this guy here. Sort of <laughs> but the best bit, I mean, the evening was, uh, was really quite something. He was talking to John Bond when they were talking about hot rods and how much uh, power you have, how much thrust they get you, and Bonzo hit Elvis in the shoulder and knocked him like about uh, four or five paces, and all the sort of mind went like this, and Elvis said to John, what, what, what was that about, John? He said, I forgot to tell you, I was in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, after sitting after on Elvis's father, um, now, now we are to come to leave, we're now two and a half hours later. And I get to the door and Elvis is saying to his house, and it seems off and all that. And I shook him at the door and I said to him, I'm really sorry for sitting on your day. <laughs> and he looked me full in the eye and he said, stick around kids, you might get a permanent job. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved I mean, the kid bit, I was really. Call me that all year long. How did you uh, how did you get into this game? Well, I was a stage man. When I was 14, I was a stage man in what's, I think, over here is called Vaudeville, but Verizon. Mm. Yeah, I was a stage man. Burlesque, sort of thing, yeah. Burlesque, yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> Croydon, Burlesque. Croydon, no doubt, the Croydon Empire. And you, and so, and what happened? You went from that into what? Well, I went from that, and uh, then I did lots of, you know, I worked for Reuters, the press agency, as a sort of messenger boy and things, and I went into, um, and I went in to do my army service like you had to do in those days. And, and during that time, um, 
because uh, when they found out that I'd worked as a stage hand and that, we used to have, like, they used to have shows come to the army base every month, and I used to help run those and things like that. And when you came out of the service? When I came out of that, I did uh, film extra work, I doubled for Robert Morley. And when the I, guns of Navarro? I said, yes, I did the guns, I was in the guns of the Playing gun. gun. No, no, no. <laughs> No, 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 not really. No. <laughs> Bad idea, though. <laughs> uh, I actually, uh, I stood in for Anthony Quinn on the film. I did some doubling with him mm. during that film. Mm. I'll look out for you next time. You better. And you were wrestling yeah. a for a while. Yeah, you? I did a bit of wrestling for a while. A bit of wrestling and a bit of minding. And I had to, uh, you know, it's like the one in the band uh, who's got a van, you know, the truck always gets the job. Well, I had a mini bus and I used to drive vans around. Like so, which band in particular? Just, just, yeah, just, just Carl, Carl Danger, was it? Carl Denver? Carl Denver, yeah. Carl Denver, Carl Denver, Carl Denver The Shadows, yeah. Emil Ford. And the Checkmates. Yeah, and the Checkmates, yeah. I'm sure you remember that. Yeah, yeah. I'm bold enough, yeah. And then? Thank you. <laughs> Five dollars in an envelope will get you anywhere. <laughs> it's true. In Peter's case, two dollars. Um, <laughs> And you, when did you get into the sort of the mainstream? I mean, because I know you've got some of the early rock and roll acts. Well, from that, uh, from doing that, I got into doing an individual tour manager, managing, and I worked for uh, Little Richard. Uh, mainly it was when the acts came over to England. I worked for Little Richard. I worked with Jerry Lee Lewis. I worked with the Everly Brothers. And uh, I worked with Gene Vince, I was Gene Vince's manager when he came to live in England for a year, I was with him for a year. And then I went on to do in like being with a yeah, major tour manager. Now, at one point you were, I don't know if it was a this person, you worked for a very well-known uh, UK promoter stroke manager for Don Arden. Yes. And Don went on to manage uh, ELO and Roy Wood's Wizard. But uh, well, at that first, time, I first met Don <coughs> when I was doing uh, tours with the uh, with the uh, with the bus. When I used to look after these small tours before the rock and roll people, and it was like Dick Charles and the City Gents, which was a sort of tramp jam band in England. And Don and there's some dancers and a singer. And Don was the comedian compare. That's when I first met Don. <laughs> He's still a comedian. <laughs> He's still that. And. No, because you told me a story once about it. he sent you off to get Chuck Berry or something. <coughs> well, yes, uh, after I started to do, I started to work more in the office, and uh, he was keen. Chuck Berry had never been to England, and that was a, a big thing. And uh, Don said to me one day, he said, I want you to go to St. Louis uh, and meet Chuck Berry and make a deal for him to come to England. And he gave him both and like $100 for the ticket. I remember I got on that one night, 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 in like a sort of 57 fair lane with the muffler gone, the exhaust was gone. And he drove me up funny enough to the Sheraton in St. Louis. <coughs> I said to ask him to come in for a drink. He said, no, no, you can't come in for a drink. Uh, I won't come in for a drink. But tomorrow, we go to Chicago to Chess Records. You have to come there with me. He said, and he could go to the hotel because he was black. Well, I, yeah, I didn't realize that, you know, it was my first time really in America. And I was this, what, what, yeah, this was a 63, yeah. 63. So he duly picked me up the next morning in this uh, in this Ford, and uh, we flew off to Chicago and got a cab, which I had to pay for to Chess Records. <laughs> I mean, Chess Records was, was one I'd only heard, I'd known one other Englishman had never been there, was uh, Andrew Oldman, who was the manager of the Stones. Mm. And it was literally one of like a speaking the trap doors, a double fronted shop. And I went in there and uh, very nervous and was wheeled into an office there and there was uh, Leonard Chess in like the braces, you know. 
and it's a car and one of those things like you deal with cards in and all that. And uh, uh, the rock was, oh, you the limey guy, huh? So I said, well, you know, I suppose I'm from England, if that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm certainly not a lemon, I, I said it to myself. I was still a bit nervous. Um, and uh, I met with Chuck's, uh, Chuck's, Chuck's lawyer and we, we made a deal what Don had said to try and get in for, you know. And Chuck said to me, uh, the only thing you have to do for me is make sure you get a good piano player. He wants a great piano player. But, um, I mean, I've met some mean men in my time, but I think, uh, I mean, just as versified, Robert Plant is a very tight man. I mean, when he first came to the Led Zeppelin, I said, uh, Robert, you're going to start earning money. I went to Jimmy, I said to Timmy Page, I said, there's a man who, who uh, knows how to save a penny. And after he'd been in the band uh, about for just under a year, he came to me one day, he said, do you remember him saying that to me? And I said, yeah, sure I do. You know, he said, well, I'm the man who knows how to save a hate me. That's Robert Plant. But anyway, back to Chuck Berry. So we go to leave, and Leonard Chess and his lawyer said, drive Peter to the, to the airport. So Chuck had a very funny look in his face. When we went out of the back of Chess Records, it was like a, a car lot, a lot, a car park full of Cadillacs. And we get into this Cadillac, and I said to Chuck, this is nice. When we set up for the airport, and he said, uh, he said, it costs, costs a lot of money to run these cars. Petrol was very expensive. And then what he did, he took me to the downtown bus terminal. He said, I said, but this isn't the airport. He said, oh, I can't afford to go to the airport. And I had to get out and get on the bus in my way. Just because I think it's, in, it's interesting to me, what was the deal? I mean, because... You know, going back to 63, here you are, you've come over, you've got a major American rock star, he's coming to England and he's playing just... Well, it was dollars, I forget the dollar amount, but it came to like £670 and some change, like four on threepence, mm -hmm. that he had to be paid before he went off. I mean, um, and Chuck, I got on pretty well with Chuck, because I had this idea, I said to him, this is the first time in England, and I got him to like, for the MC, normally, you know, the tabs go back and you're on stage, and I talked him into doing a long lead, having a really long lead, and I got John Hawkins and piano playing. Well, that's for Roy Young. Teams, yeah. yeah, Roy Young was my original choice. Yeah. And they announced him, they could hear Chuck playing, and he came on doing the duck wall and just exploded. I remember this, because I actually went to one of those shows. Did you? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 It's really, really exciting. Yeah, but one night, he was going on, and I went, paid him his money, and I didn't have that old four shilling throats, which is, how much is, what is that in sales? <laughs> Nothing. 50 cents or something, yeah, yeah. 50, 60 cents. And he went, I ain't going. <laughs> so I had to go out and borrow this four and four, exactly, to get it because he wouldn't go on stage. He just wouldn't, he went away. And, I mean, after you'd worked with these sorts of artists, with, with Don, what happened then? Well, I was on the tour with the Everly Brothers and uh, Bo Diddley. And we were in <laughs> a city called Newcastle, mm -hmm. which you know very well. City Hall. Yes. yes, I was indeed. And Jerome was in, was a, was a both in some record player, who always walked around with this little radio, which was never on. <laughs> and I said to him, well, and I got quite friendly with Jerome, and I said to him, why is the radio never on? You know, and he said, yes. Don't tell Bo, and he, he folded, it was a custom made thing. He opened it up and there's half a bottle of whiskey in it. <laughs> that is why this right. But anyway, we went to the... It was a very fortunate I went to see a... We went to a club in Newcastle, which I think was called the Agogo, if I remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there was a band playing, it was called the Alan Price Rhythm and Blues Combo. And I met a guy called Mike Jeffries, and the, and the band bridged something I was, I was called Eric Burton. Absolutely fantastic hand on them. They weren't called the animals at that time. Mm -hmm. And that became really the first band that I did things with. And you had some involvement at this point, or, or you came into involvement with Mickey Mouse, I think. Yeah. Well, Mickey had been, uh, Mickey and I worked in the Two Eyes Copy Bar in 1956. Mickey was in a, an act called The Most Brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mickey used to make the coffees, the espressos, and I, I saw the tickets, you know, and took the money for it because it was a celebration. I took a pound off the people to go in and all that. Mm. 
And he only used to take 10% out of our money from the pound of iron each. He used to take his 10% of us. And he, he, in fact, Mickey came to England, uh, he, uh, not only was he dinner, but he was also a performing, wasn't Absolutely, he? Absolutely, yes. To yes. No, well, what happened was, he went to South Africa, became a very successful uh, artist there. He had sort of 18 sort of top five records there. And when he came back, I just started being a tour manager for these big tours. And Mickey looked me up and said, like, listen, I haven't got any work or anything, and uh, I got him on the tour, as the opening act, and occasional combat, still working for Donald. Mm -hmm. So, and, so, when you were up in Newcastle and you saw Alan Price and this group, what happened then? There was some deal done, was it, for them to come down to London? Well, Mickey and I went to South to see them when they were the animals. Right. And, um, uh, uh, they came down to, uh, down to London and Mickey wanted someone that was a record producer and I at that time was still working for Don and we, uh, Don wanted to be their agent, you see. So um, the, I said to them, and by that time I'd set up the Chuck Berry to, you know, the big theatre so it was a big, big thing and all that. And I said to the animals, listen, if you sign with Mickey and you sign with the agency, then I'll... Uh, you know, you can do the Chuck Berry sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, which was a fair enough thing, mm -hmm. which uh, they were thrilled with. But I remember the day of something in the contract. We were in the office, and as usual, there was loads and loads of paper, which was laid out on the floor. And they were about to sign, and Eric Burton suddenly said to me, we met before. I said, yeah, the club he said, no, before that. He said, but you don't remember. And I said, no, I don't remember. So he said, well, why you once threw me down a corridor? Look at the sign, it's all done. And he said, I threw him down a corridor. So I said, well, I thought, well, I said, what do you mean I threw him down a corridor? He said, well, and he owned up, he, he once gate crashed Gene Vincent's dressing room. And he said, suddenly he found himself being lifted by the sea of his pants and by his neck and thrown out. And it was me that had done it. And he said, well, I was out of order, I shouldn't have been in there. And the deal was. So they signed the deal. Yes. And they, didn't, they, didn't they make House of the Rising something? Didn't they come down on the overnight train or something? Yes, something? they did. They did. They came down and the train got in at 7 in the morning. And, and they made the record by 8 or something? Yeah. No, they were, I think the, the record was literally made in sort of 20 minutes. I mean, it was a one take job. Mm -hmm. It was a one take job. They signed the studios. Yeah. yeah. And take me on from there. So you're involved. You've got, you're now involved sort of very firmly in the mainstream and you've. Another tour management thing. Yeah, and now I'm booking, I'm booking the animals. And I was kind of co managing the animals in a way because Mike Jeffries was never there, he was away. Mm. Mike yeah. went on to manage Jimi Hendrix. He did indeed, yes, he did. He and he Chaz, Chaz who was the bass player in the animals. And a, nas and a, na a national team was also one of my bands. They presumably were back in Chuck because all these uh, uh, bits. No, of... they weren't. It was uh, it basically was King Size Taylor and the Dominoes with John Hawking on the keyboard. <coughs> which was a Liverpool band, and also um, Terry Flynn the Flintstones, which is the first band I ever managed, right. which is Terry Slater, who now manages Phil Everly and Ah Ha. Ah Ha, yeah, Terry, Terry managed them, he, they were the backing band. <laughs> and how did you get from this, I mean, I know there was another point, I think Donovan came into the picture, didn't he? Were you involved with Donovan? <coughs> Yes, well, I, I, in a way, I was involved with Donovan. What it was is that uh, Donovan's first manager had a, had a dispute and they parted ways. And I tried to get Donovan to manage to, I thought I'd like to manage Donovan, you know. Uh, but he, by that time, had been talking to a guy called Ashley Kozak. Mm. And the reason I was involved, Mickey most, uh, at that time, had an exclusive deal where he had to give everything to CBS or Epic. Vermont Alan Klein. <laughs> so Klein called me up and he said, look, if you can get Donovan for Mickey, if you can put it all together, I'll give you a piece of the action. And which I am, um, were great words, it was a hell of a job to get the action part of it. <laughs> Tell me about that, Peter, because... Well, I had to go in one day and persuade Mr. Klein. He had to be helped out of his chair by his hotel. But this was <laughs> the money. And he had a, like a minder there, and he was a gun or something. Who, who? Uh, well, I think he did outside. Marty Mischel was there. He's a lawyer. Yeah. 
And he sent Marty to the uh, bank to get the money because I wouldn't take a check, actually. I think it was. Yeah, I wouldn't take one. And it was $12,000, which is still a lot of money yeah. today, you know, but I mean, in those days, that was a fortune. Now, during this period, presumably you must have first met Jimmy Page because Jimmy was playing on some of these records. Yeah, well, no, I first met Jimmy when he was playing for a band called Carter Lewis and the Southern and Neil Christian and the Crusade, so I knew Jimmy then. And of course, I knew him as a. As a session of the studio, we did all the other songs. We did uh, the Kings. Uh, yes, he did the Kings. He's, that's him on You Really Got Me. He made that riff up. That was Jimmy's riff. Mm. Yeah. He is the king of the riff. I he is the king of the riff around there. Mm. I think he still is, actually. Mm. Not the cover they were playing. Private joke there, folks. Um, so, he, so you're at this point and you, you're involved with Donovan, and you're doing all this booking and all the rest of it. And how did you, because then you start getting into management proper, I think, with uh, people like Rod Stewart and, and Jack right. Beck? Uh, well, no, that came a bit later. Uh, I did a lot of other things. I did things like I looked after uh, Herman's Hermits. Harvey Lisberg said, will you go and take care of my boys to LA? And I thought, well, I've never been to LA, so... <laughs> Sounds like a nice trip, and I did, yeah. And then anybody else have noticed? Uh, well, it's actually the one that, though it wasn't my musical taste, so I had to tell you, <laughs> was a friend of mine called Jeff Stevens wrote a song called Winchester Cathedral, mm. of which they played on everything and everything, and it was a massive hit. This was the new vaudeville band? The new vaudeville band. Not my taste. But I found up a guy who was Andy Wickham, who was Andy Wycamp Wickham, who was an East guy who was working for Mo Austin. Mm. And I called him up, and uh, I knew he called him Tuesday night, he'd get a billboard chart, and I said to him, have you heard this song and all that? And he said, it's like the anthem here in America. It's 33 with a bullet first week. So I thought, well, maybe I could do something like that. And I met the next day with Jeff Stevens, <coughs> And uh, he said, listen, will you get a band? We haven't got a band. Well, we've got a band. They're all dressed in modern suits and things like that. And I said, yeah, OK, I'll see if I can sort it out for you. I'll, I'll he said, well, there's only one thing. He said, tomorrow morning, the Prince of Wales Theatre in Leicester Square, they're doing an audition for the Royal Command performance. I thought, do you want this for the Royal Command performance? And so I duly turned up there, and Lord Delphine and Bernard Delphine was there, and they failed the audition. <laughs> and I hired a writer, a very good comedy writer called Mitch Reveley, and we rented a, I rented a theatre in um, Catford, or somewhere around there, in South East London, that is. And uh, together we went out and we went to all the jump shops, and we dressed them like a sort of... It's what, one of those... Twenties. Uh, uh, yeah, an affordable band, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But that was then with your sort of first management clients in a way yes proper. in a way so, yes yes and yes. when so you're working with them what happens next well the next thing was um i knew lots and lots of musicians and i've got to say the one thing that always stood me in good stead apart from have if i had not had the experience of dealing with and looking after little richard and taking him around France. I mean, little Richard was unbelievable. I mean, I once had a fly with him from, uh, he hated flying from Berlin to Paris. And I got him to agree to come on a plane, but what I didn't tell him in those days, because of the Berlin Wall, you couldn't fly direct from Berlin to another country. You had to stop at like a Dusseldorf or somewhere like that. <coughs> and we had to stop and change planes and he wouldn't get back on the plane. I had to get in the cab. All the way, a cab from Dusseldorf to Paris, but I got in there. I mean, you know, that's the game, isn't it? You've got to get your artist there, yeah, whatever you yeah, want to do. Yeah. Uh, but little Richard, little Richard once told a story. Um, in 1970, he was playing at the Newport Lounge, which is a place in Miami, the Newport Beach Resort Hotel. He's playing the lounge. So I said to Zach, the lad, do you want to go and see little Richard? So I rang up and booked it. And of course, as we are when you go to bands, they're always late. And, uh, you, you know, it was a sit down thing at tables, like a club, but we're being shown to the table. And little Richard saw me and did a double take. And he, uh, he stopped the number and all that. And he proceeded to tell all these, you know, mine, they're all in the pink rinses, you know, and, the, and all that, and the blue hair, and the, 
all the vet and all that. He proceeds to tell the audience, he said, see that man there's Mr. Peter? He, he saved my life in Paris. Because we came out of a place once, and the police, as you know, can get very rough there. Mm. And there was a hell of a thing there. And I actually laid three of the police for now. <laughs> and he proceeded to tell the whole audience a story. <laughs> they were like, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so where are we? I've completely lost. So, uh, <laughs> so he's not paying attention, is he? Dennis is taking notes down there. Yeah, he's a lawyer, he was. I am, I just um, need a blackboard to follow. No, but uh, no, then what happened was, there was a man called Simon Napier Bell, ah. who came to me and asked me if I would manage the Yardbirds. He was the second manager of the Yardbirds. George Ekermousey was the first mm. one. So he came to see me and... Uh, They've been in their sort of pop phase. They were in their pop phase, so run the sideways down and the uh, foil and, and all that, you know, those sort of things, yeah. And uh, he said, would I meet with him? Because he wanted to become a film producer and he wanted out of the pop, inverted commas, pop business. Mm. And uh, I said, OK, I'll meet him. And he said to me, there's only one thing, he said, there's a big troublemaker in the band. There's a real pain in the arse in the band. So I said, oh, who's that? So he said, Jimmy Page. And he doesn't know that I know Jimmy. So I said, oh, really? Is he funny, is he? So I go to the meeting, which was in Harold Davidson's office. Mm -hmm. And I only knew the other yard by so saying, hello, fellas, in it, ready at the top of the ready, steady, go. And I'd yeah. seen him around how I, but I didn't know him. But I knew Jimmy <coughs> very well, you know? And uh, when I got to the meeting, I said to uh, Jimmy, I hear I have to get rid of you, you're a troublemaker. <coughs> what have you been up to? He said, I'll tell you why I've been a troublemaker. He said, I've just done a five-week tour of America with, um, I can't remember who was on the bill, I forget it now. He said, we did blow up, and it's only blow up. He said, wrote it, recorded it, you know, appeared in the film. We did three weeks tour, which I'd seen, at, uh, with the Rolling Stones and I can see in the turn, and we mm. got... 112 pounds each, and I went, oh, now I know he's a troublemaker. Because he was the only one who's a real pro mm. that said, hey, what's this shit about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was the only guitar player in the band, Jeff? Yes, yeah. yes, because uh, he also, Simon asked me if I'd like to look, take care of, I'd manage Jeff as well, separately. He was out of the band. Yeah. And I knew Jeff. Had uh, Jeff got the band with Rod Stewart and Mickey Wong? No, well, that came. No, we're coming to right. that. Right. Came. All right, sorry. Please. So I took uh, <laughs> So I met, uh, I met with Jeff and he said, will you help me form a band? And we got uh, Ronnie Wood in on bass, oh Nicky Hopkins, Nicky Wood on bass, and Rod Stewart, which I thought Rod was great, because I'd known Rod since he was Rod the Mob. I'd known him around and all that. Mm. And I mean, it was incredible, really. I mean, it was amazing. Mickey most wouldn't use him. Jeff had to sing from my own song along with him. And because Mickey didn't work, and Nick Rod could sing. No, he wasn't very keen on work. Mm. So there was it. So then we got a wonderful, I mean, Rod Stewart was a wonderful, it still is, and all the same, a wonderful singer, you know. And I said to Jeff, Jeff was coming, and I heard him on the radio, and I was going to go tell him the story how they were ready to, he was ready to quit, and I said, no, don't quit, I'll give you an American tour. And I came over to New York and all that, and I helped him make the trees out of them. Remember now? Yeah, great. Well, well, I have it, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, have it, you know. Mm -hmm. I, got, uh, I got Pete Moon to play Tim, some mm -hmm. old man robber. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Paul Jones, because I've known Jonesy uh, since he was in Herbie Boyd and Night Siders, and he also was in the bank with Jet Harrison. <coughs> Tony yeah. When I was Gene Vincent's tour manager, we'd done it too. I guess I knew Jones. I got him in to play Hammond or went on a couple of things. And mm -hmm. I made this album, went over, and my first real experience of record companies. Len Levy of Epic Records. I said, this album is wonderful. He said, don't tell me the record business. He said, you know, like in England for a start with. He said, if it, if it becomes, if you can get a hit single, we'll think about the album. And I said, no, no, we've got to. He said, I can't talk, I'm going to a convention in Las Vegas. And the office closed down there with Las Vegas, and we were playing in what became the film release for two nights. For Bill Grant. That's the Jeff Beck group. That's the Jeff Beck group, you know. We we still we were on a trying to think about I think we were on with the vanilla fudge bowl. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean the review in the New York Times on Monday was 
a column by about sort of about sort of good seven inches, maybe more. Mm. It was fantastic, fantastic review. I mean, if you and I sat down and read, you couldn't do it. It was a great mm. review. Mm. So I photostated the courier. I photostated the uh, the write up, including the New York Times headline, and I sent it to Levy at this epic record convention in Las Vegas. And I put a note by courier, and I put, "Do you want this band or don't you? If you don't want them, call me back." And all that, and of course they panic. I couldn't believe it. And funny, I don't know whether you saw the Grammy Awards recently. A bit of Jeff. Yeah. Jeff was asked to do um, uh, to do a, a thing on Rod Stewart. I think Rod got an award, did he? Or was that for another? I don't know. I don't know. And Jeff it. called me up and said, <laughs> "Oh right." Well, Jeff called me up a few weeks ago and said, "Just refresh me on what they said." And they didn't want Rod Stewart. Epic Records said, you want to get yourself a proper singer. <laughs> and Jeff wanted to be able to say that he got a chance on this year's Grammys. Mm. Because he didn't oh, I don't know if he did, but, but uh, they were a great, great band. And that's a, fun, that's a classic album, actually, I think. It is a classic album, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. I think there's a good version of Morning Dew on it, if I remember. The reason they A song which every band of that era played, of course. Yes, it did, yeah. And um, it's just... Go back to the Yardbirds for a second, because I know they're your favourite subject. <laughs> Did, so you, you've taken on the Yardbirds at this point, and, mm-hmm. and you're quite happy with Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. and what I had, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. great, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, and Jimmy knew me, and so they went off to uh, do a tour of Australia, which had already been booked. Yeah. I didn't go with them. They went off. You must and, have been around uh, about this. I must one. say that uh, the Yardbirds have always been extremely. Uh, uh, nice to me and they did a yard you saw, you saw, you saw that yard bird special two years ago they did a special on on the history of the yard bird mm-hmm. and chris Dre, who was the original guitarist and bass player in the band and jim mccarthy actually said the only time they ever made money was during the yeah. this brief spell they were with me you know. and they kept up from australia and yes and i said about them getting them a few dates and getting them organized and getting an american tour and while in, just before that, I got um, uh, Jeff, I got Jeff, that, that's who I'm talking about over there. And uh, it's in fact, while I was with, and uh, while we were on the Yardbird American tour, there were a lot of artistic disputes. Jimmy had a certain vision of the way they wanted, wanted to go in music, musical direction, and some of the others weren't. And, uh, Epic had uh, insisted on recording a live album at the Anderson Theatre that was a disaster. Mm. Which uh, I said, oh, I can do it, but you can't put it out without permission for it. So mm. it got canned, you know. And two years later, when of course <coughs> Seabrook tried to wheel it out in 73, on, on Jimmy's name, which I managed to sort out, and they gave us a nice second, or they gave Jimmy a nice second. Without you know, having to. Right. You know, <laughs> I mean, you started off this conversation and saying I was a wrestler. You realise I've been wrestling all these mm. years. Up here, though, I'm with record companies. Peter's wrestling name, incidentally, was Count. Uh, Am I going to say it? Count Massimo? And Bruno Alessio, who landed on Anyway, so uh, was it on this tour that the Yarnabos broke up? Yes, they did. I mean, you were down in Florida, I think, or something. Uh, you got to the end of the tour. that part of the world, and end of the tour, and it was a day off. And there's a date for a, a wonderful guy, the guys that called Marshall Brevitz. They used to have a club called the Image Club. And he agreed to pay him $5,000, which was a fortune in those days. And the majority didn't want to stay for the date. And Jimmy said, well, I'll do it on my own for $5,000. You know, Mr. Page is always like... Mr. Page, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mr. Page likes the loose change, doesn't he? Yeah, he does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what I did was, so the others went, and I, in my uh, very amateurish way, because I was in the middle of nowhere, uh, without a lawyer, got them to sign a letter which basically gave Jimmy the name of the Yardbirds. And when we eventually got back, so the <coughs> no more. And when we came back to England, uh, uh, after a few days of that, and Jimmy came up to see me, and we were out <coughs> driving the car. We were out. I can remember where it was in Bond Savile Theatre and I said to Jimmy, you know, what are you going to do? Are you, know, you going to go back to sessions or, <coughs> or what, do you, what do you want to do? Are you going to carry the, the yard birds off or, or no, what are you going to do? You know? And he said, uh, 
know, you know, I like to get a band together. I've got some ideas for a band. And um, I said, OK, and how would you go? What would you do? I remember saying to him, what about a producer? And he said, well, I'd like to produce the first record myself. And if it doesn't work out, if I don't cut it, we'll think about getting it done. But let's get a band together. And that's what we said about uh, getting them together. We had them. Um, he was doing a couple of sessions and he bumped into Jonesy because they'd done a lot of sessions in the park. Mm. And uh, Jonesy said to him, like, um, I hear you might be getting a band together, bear me in mind, you know. Mm. And I was managing a singer at the time called Terry Reed. Mm. Great singer. Yeah, good singer, great singer. And uh, Jimmy was very keen to have Terry Reed as a singer. And we bumped into uh, Terry Reed, uh, and then my office in Oxford Street there one day, and Jim and I went out for a drink for a pint or something. And uh, Terry said, look, I really want to concentrate on my solo career. He said, but he said, I know a singer in Burnley who would be really great, a blues singer. You should go and see him. And that was Robert, that was mm -hmm. Robert. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, now this is quite I, a funny tale. So I do attract where Robert was playing down in, I think it was the Band of Joy. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy, Chris, Joe and I drove up and we arrived at this school and went to the back entrance and asked uh, for Robert Clarns and uh, this big, huge, blonde guy who was funny enough a, a University of Toronto taking t-shirts on, shirt on that. and I remember he went, off he went and Jimmy said, fuck, you know, I've got a big road, you haven't got enough, you know. <laughs> and one of those, oh, that's Robert Clarns, that's Robert Clarns. Anyway, we went in the store and really liked and we talked to Robert afterwards and Jimmy said, well, why don't you come down to my house and bring all your record collection down? And he was a bit apprehensive about joining maybe the New Yard or sort of thing. And he also said to me, he had a bit of a dilemma, he said, I'm in love with two sisters. And I said, like, I'm to marry and I'm like, oh, I should have known, shouldn't I? <laughs> one is pregnant and all that. I said, well, I think that's the one you should marry. <laughs> Managerial advice. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't he bring Shirley down to... Uh, he did. He did after we brought, problem, yes, yes, once the band was born, <coughs> he actually brought Shirley down. He brought us to the line. He brought us to the line. He brought us to the line. And helped him make a decision. <laughs> and but what, what happened, getting back to what happened was, you know, uh, Robert went down to Jimmy's house and pulled all his blues collection down. Mm. And I went away with uh, <coughs> with uh, Rod Stewart and Jeff Beck. And I was in San Francisco. We were playing San Francisco before. And I'm in the hotel and my phone went and it was Jimmy. I thought, this is incredible. I mean, Jimmy pays investing in an overseas boy. <laughs> <laughs> I so I think this must be something. And he said, and he said gee, he said, I saw a drummer last night that is just under this guy. He's so powerful, so good, but so loud that clubs will not book the band if he's in the group. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is um, John Bonham. You know. So I said, well, I'll be back in England for two days. And I proceeded to track Tom Tap John down. He was working for Tim Rose and was on a 40 pound a week with Tim. Playing more than June. Playing more than June, no doubt. Mm -hmm. And I sent 40 telegrams, he never answered one. <laughs> he never sent one, and then eventually he did, but that 40 telegrams, he said, he tells me, he tells me, he tells me, they've still got them. And that, uh, that was it. And they went away to rehearse, I got some gigs together, and it was the first gig I ever saw uh, John play, in fact, actually, the band was in Copenhagen. As, as a New York band? As to be facing New Yorkers, because we didn't have a name really, and nobody wanted to forget anything other than that, you know. And there was kind of verbal commitments from Simon Navy well left over, and I thought, well, they take, you know what, Ed, and I'm sure you'd agree with me, no matter how long the band rehearses, there's nothing better than actually That's playing yeah. in a club. Yeah. You know, it's like a rehearsal, but they get to know each other musically, you know. And there's no, there's that, no substitute for rehearsing. There's no like. substitute for that, you know. <coughs> and Jimmy told me a funny story, apparently, like that. Uh, John Bonham turned around and saw me in the wings, and he said, and he said to Jimmy, he said, okay, well, look at the size of that guy there. What the fuck is that? And Jimmy went, shut up, that's our manager. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, well, he, he came over and shook hands with Yeah, he did. He came over and introduced himself and said he'd like to speak to me and all that. And he's getting, they, he and Rob were on £50 a week each retaining, you know, to get involved with this Jimmy, obviously, was fairly well off in session work and John. And uh, Bonzo said to me, he said, <coughs> as he went with his hair and all that, he said, um, uh, obviously it costs money to get all the equipment here. If I could get another £50 a week, I'd drive the truck. <laughs> he went another 50 quid a week for driving the truck. <laughs> well, that was the first day of, of actually that. We saw them, because, I mean, in the situation you're talking about, uh, with hindsight, but when you first saw them, I mean, did you have any perception at all that it would go on to become what it became? Or was it just like a gut thing? It was a gut feeling. I mean, nobody could have, uh, I don't think, obviously, uh, to, to the heights that they did climb to by. But I, you see, the thing is, and I know you've heard this, you say this before, but I say it to the benefit of all the managers here. The most important thing when you take the ground is you've got to believe in it. Mm. Belief is the most important thing. And I believe, I knew Jimmy would get a tremendous. And when I said, I really believed, and it was purely a gut, a gut reaction. I thought, this, is got, this is the best thing I've ever heard. What songs were they doing there? Uh, how many more times? Mm. Uh, a bit of dazed and confused, and a few yardbird things, and a few old rock things. Anything that would fill the two forty-five minutes in, basically. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Cause I yeah, and it was one because he could always extend the guitar yeah. solo. So you know, there's, there's an eight-minute number. <laughs> and how many more times with that kind of thing? You always got to be out of trouble at the end. Because yeah. I saw them around about this period. I think at the Marquee Club, and if I remember right, they only played about three tunes. And I think. A long one, so yeah, well, they used to play tunes for about an hour. <laughs> and the thing I remember about them was, you know, there's no lights and there's really no production, but the, no, the energy coming off the stage was just yeah. unbelievable. And I have to say, as a pathetic runner, Bonham was out there. I mean, 19 yeah. years old, you know. 19 years old. Carmine Apathy is a fine drummer with Vanilla Fudge, and I remember Carmine saying on the radio, when they first came, he said, I don't know who the drummer is in Led Zeppelin, but he's got a right foot like a pneumatic drill. <laughs> I was just incredible. And we, so anyway, we set off ready to get it together and to do an album, and we recorded <coughs> the first album for £1,800, including the cover, we made that. And because Jimmy had a great policy of no rehearsing in the studio, <laughs> and you know, we had like a, a roster for John to play on that headset. Some really good live sounds. The huge sound, sound, you know, the huge on sound, that yeah. first album, Zeppelin yeah. One, is a very live sound. Did you have a record deal at this point? Uh, I was talking to. I was talking to. Now, there's a quite an interesting, interesting story here about uh, you, you referred to Jimmy Clive Davis. Yeah, the Clive Davis, the CBS thing. Yeah. Oh, well, that was quite epic. Excuse the pun. No, no, I love the pun. Uh, <laughs> what happened was, um, I talked to Jerry Wexler. And Wexler basically said, I want the band. He didn't even know who was in it. So I said, Jimmy Page is getting the band, I'll do it. And went round and told, hey, the word went round New York. And Mickey got a call from Alan Klein and Clive Davis to say, what's this about a new yard burst? Well, Mickey, being as Mickey is, and I'm not knocking at all, said, you're going to have to sort this one out, Peter. So, I said, I don't know, I'll sort it out. So off I went to New York, was with Wexler, and then uh, it was agreed with Wexler, and a rough idea, I didn't want to sign for more than five albums. You know, I didn't want to sign for more than five albums, I think they wanted six albums. But uh, we nearly, it was a ball, there was a, a sort of a breaker on it. I think their lawyer was a guy called Mike Mayer, I think. Mm -hmm. Mayer Nascol, I think, was the lawyer. Cats. Uh, right. And I don't know, again, I've always ever played, i played, I've always played all my life by gut reaction. And one of the things that I excluded from the contract was recordings from motion picture soundtracks. And they said, it's got to go in. And I said, no, you can't have that. And we got, got everything else I basically wanted. Because remember, at that time, this is a big thing for me. I was busking a bit. I didn't have a, have a lot of knowledge of doing. We were all busking all of the time. We were all, but, I mean, you know, 
it was Ed in those days it was an adventure. He said that this is a journey, an adventure. He didn't win them. Anyway, it's, um, their lawyer told our lawyer the deal was off. And I said, well, tell them to shove it then. I don't care. I'll find somewhere. But I really wanted to be on Atlantic. And that was the first time I'd met Ahmed before. I'd met Ahmed. First time I met Ahmed, he and Robert Stigwood were presenting um, uh, Cream with a gold record at Madison Square Garden in the round, and they nearly fell over with the stage going around. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I always remember seeing that kid. And like the amps were coming, it was like, Wah! and it went off that way. So I remember thinking, if ever I'm fortunate enough to manage anybody that could play this place, I'm never going to play it for a round. We'll do without a few seats. Anyway, going back to it, uh, it was all off, and Army called me and said, What's the problem? And I said, Army, this is it. I just want, for some reason, I don't know why, I don't want to give away the uh, rights. And he went, Yeah, okay, Pete, is, is that going to make you are you happy with that? He said, is there anything else? I said, no, no, just that. And he said, that's okay, we don't straight in. And from that, my relationship with armies started, started which ran all the way through up until after the Zeppelin were no more. And at this point, was this a worldwide deal or? No, England was excluded. You want me to tell a story, will you? No, we'll always got to no, 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 it's great. And one in England? <laughs> uh, for some reason, they didn't want England. And I went to see my records. I thought, well, I go around anywhere. <laughs> that oh, is anywhere. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but I only went in like just for the sake of it, you know. And they said, well, what do you want? And I said, seventeen thousand pounds for England. They threw me out of the office. <laughs> but uh, I tell you, who really did want them was Mo. Mo Austin wanted, yeah, yeah. and Mo came over because Mo knew Jimmy from the time he was a session player, and he spent time in LA. He used to. Uh, he used to do a Jackie DeShannon's records and things like that. And Mo wanted them. Yeah, and I spoke to, uh, I spoke to Army, he said, you happy? And I said, I can't understand why some people in your company. He said, no, no, I want it, I want it, I want it. And in those days, they were just too good about Polydor in Stratford Place. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and so it became a Well, it's interesting to me that your relationship was very much with the people who owned the company. Absolutely. For people like me, of course, is virtually impossible now. Oh, really? I don't know who else. No, that was a big thing, you see. You didn't have to, I didn't, I knew hardly anybody else in the company. I mean, I knew Dickie Klein, the head of promotion, and I knew one or two other people. But, you know, any time I needed them, I, I was dealing with Army. I called Army. Mm. Well, what, was the, what, what have you done with publishing at this point? Oh, we owned our own publishing. We had a, from the off? Well, yeah, right from day one. Now, well, what happened was that everybody said, I, I said to Jimmy, they're going to call it B, the organ say this is a hype, this whole thing. So I thought up this name, so we called it Super Hype Music Inc. Of which Jimmy owned the majority of the shares and I owned part of the company. And uh, the band was signed to a company called Super Hype Tapes, which leased the tapes. So, so you were making a little production. There was one thing I'd seen and heard, I thought if the band must own their own publishing. The copyright is all, all. Absolutely. and that was in 1968. And so I said that we will have that, and we'll make a deal. If the record's successful, we'll make a collection deal. Mm -hmm. So they owned all their own copyrights, and, and still, we still do. Yeah. Although I must say that Jim and I sold some of the early publishing. We sold the Super Hype Music. Inc. At the time, it seemed to make sense, but it made a big capital gain for Jimmy, because no matter what happened. He had something that was substantial. Mm. Nothing to do with his writing roles. Mm. Mm. But since then, from physical graffiti on, we owned all that publishing. Mm. Mm. So I was always, I mean, I did the same thing with Bad Company. Bad Company owned their own copyrights. Mm. We, I just formed a company called Bad Co Music Inc. and got uh, Ireland and uh, uh, England and Europe, and I got Warners to administer it. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, I thought that was most important. So this first record's made, and at this point you've come up with the name Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Or somebody has. Well, that came about from the B-side of High Hill with Post Silver Lining. There's an instrumental on it called Bex Bolero, yeah. which is Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, Keith Moon, John Paul Jones, Nicky Hopkins, and somebody else. And they did it as a fun jam thing in 66. And Looney had said, 
came and said, oh, this is probably going down like a Led Zeppelin, you know, or something, the depression thing. And uh, so Jimmy and I thought, man, it's not a bad name. I said, it's not a bad name for the band. And uh, the only thing I didn't like about it, it looked like L-E-A-D was like, lead you up the garden path, you know, like, I didn't like the A, and that time, um, you know, light and heavy, but I happened to be in the office one day, and I wrote down a big piece of called L-E-D, Zeppelin, and I rang Jimmy up and I said, it looks much better, it sounds much better, and he said, okay, Peter, let's go for that. Mm. And that became the I mean, I'm, picking names for bands is difficult, and that's a, that is a great name, because it very much, yeah. it described what the music was like, in a way. Yes, it did. Yeah. But this yeah. first record, this because, was, because people, Talk about all the heavy stuff, but that's right. There's a lot of acoustic car mm -hmm. exactly one. Yeah. So this this record's made and, uh, and it comes out. Yeah. And you start touring behind it, I guess, or promoting it. Because you never did television. Hardest thing, no, no. No television. Tell you how to tell it, no, no television and no single. Well, first of all, the single market in England. Where you had to, but you had to go through a panel that was run by a 65-year-old woman, yeah, Doreen Davis. Doreen Davis decided that your record got on the radio, and I thought, I'm not going to go through that BBC machinery. But there was a television program in England called, I think it was called the Old Grey Whistle Test. It was, yeah. And I am, um, I thought, you know, there are a lot of very good bands. I thought maybe we ought to do that, and I arranged for the uh, producer to come. Uh, Mike Appleton. No, no, he wasn't produced at that time. Okay. There was somebody earlier than that. Yeah. I arranged for them to come to see the band at the Marquee. And I sent a very nice limo to pick them up and all that. And that afternoon, which in actual fact was one of the others when I first saw you, when I was trying to yeah. say the agency, yeah. and Ed, I was up at the agency, you know, I was not too many agents here, but well, they're better now, they trying to get an agent to come and see your band in those days was like, forget it. And I was up trying to ensue Christmas was the age to come and see the band that night. And Ed happened to come in the office when I was trying to say, oh, come on, fellas, it's really good and all that. That was a very young and very That afternoon, I went down to Wall Street and the 200-yard queue at about 4 o'clock. Mm. I thought, this is wonderful. I was in it. Just half <laughs> way. I know, I've still got your money. Yeah, I know. That was at the bloody, <laughs> that was at the bloody back as well. Well done. <laughs> And that night, the BBC didn't turn up, and I thought, and I said to the band there, bollocks, I saw that cue, the reaction you've had tonight, and I realised that was where it's at. If you've got the belief of the people in the street, or the kids in the street, whatever, if you've got them, those are your people, bollocks to the television, and I said, that we're not going to do any television, we're not going to do television, and those things are that. This is typically an album thing. I knew that's it, because I just knew, as fans, and after speaking to some of them afterwards. You well, know, these kids have been there. Yeah, calls have got at the office and all of them. Mm. You know, I mean, they were telling me what I already knew it was a fabulous band. I mean, it was so exciting. It's so much and you very much made America your sort of focal point for that. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> you see, I'd done that tour with Yardbirds and seen what was loosely called the underground scene there. There was opinion-making places in those days. There was the Grandy Ball in Detroit. There was um, the Boston Tea Party. There was a Fillmore. And actually, there was a club in Toronto, which I can't remember the name of. I think we did it on our first tour. The Rock Pile, thank you, the Rock Pile. <laughs> Great places, you see. They were opinion-making places. So I'd done those with the other, so I was, I was lucky in the fact that I had the insight to that. So they came over here and basically played clubs. Well, they came, and that's the hardest thing. I've got, you know it's hard sometimes to tell musicians. So. <coughs> yes. <You know. laughs> Christmas 1968, mm -hmm. I said to them, I had them in the office before, and I said, look, you've got to start the door. They don't have it over at Boxing Day, but you know, the 26th of December, start this tour, which means you've got to leave, leave on Christmas Eve, fellas, and I can't come with you. And they all went, if you say that's what we've got to do, we'll go. And that was there, that was, and all the way through, if that's what we've got to do, we'll do it. And they went off and started over here. They started at the Whiskey A Go Go, and Jimmy had flu. And then you managed to do one night, I think. You know, with the vanilla fudge. 
And after four months of change around them, the middle of the went on the third. I can't imagine why. Yeah. I do. I love a great bunch of guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Philly Basile was really nice. They had a manager called Philly Basile, who later went on to becoming, you know, a promoter as well. Mm. And you, and this and time, Robert, Robert says in interviews now, I've seen him, apparently I said to Robert, I remember saying to him, you've got to crack it in San Francisco. And I, uh, to make sure that Robert really understood the seriousness of it, seriously, of all this, I said to Robert, if you don't crack San Francisco, you can go home. That's it. You've got to make it in San Francisco. Which was that important in those times. Yeah. This was what, this was what, 68? Uh, January 69. 69. January. So you were sort of at the tail end of flower power. And, but it was very much an alternative scene there. Oh, very much so, yeah. yeah, very much so. We played that. And I remember that, I remember, I mean, some amazing things. I remember the Boston Tea Party, and John had just got this, these uh, new maple leaf kit for the 26 inch bass drum. And he'd never played a kit that big, and I said to Don, though, well, you aren't going to believe the drummer in his band, and thought, like, him, John dropped the sticks about four times, you know. <laughs> but I mean, the gig was incredible. They did four hours, they ran out of gear. They played they four play hours. Four hours, they played Beatles songs. I mean, Don said they've got to go back on because they're going to just, the kids would have destroyed that place. I mean, <clears throat> the Boston Tea Party has about 800 people, and I suppose there was 1,100 in there, and they played for four hours that night. Fantastic. Mm. Fantastic. Don Law's never worried about the fire officer. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's an old synagogue. Maybe they had something to do with it. <laughs> they were used to shekels in there. And this, on this tour, <coughs> this album took off, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yeah. And, and I mean, what? Why it went. And how, how fast, how high? I mean, we put a single out as well. I think it was Communication Breakdown. Mm -hmm. It would have been true. Yeah. So you didn't release, you didn't, the, the singles policy really applied to England. Absolutely. Dory. Yeah, right, absolutely. Who incidentally wouldn't play Sultans of Swing when she must have been about 80 doing the same job. Really? <laughs> because, it had, because it had too many words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just so people know that we also had it tough. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and this is all, I mean, the buzz is happening by this part. Oh, big, very big, very yeah, big. In fact, the word went out. I remember playing before they came, that's how we got, uh, and despite everything people might have read, I always had a good relationship. I mean, Bill Graham was probably one of the finest promoters I ever met, you know. I mean, you say, I don't know if you find, you find that you remember promoters? Oh, my God, yeah. And and then, in his days, days, in my yeah. days here, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a great promoter, I mean, I'm only still around there. It's Donald K. Donald, the guy called Donald yeah, K. Donald, he's, he's, he's wonderful guy. Yeah. Right, so. He's actually he's here. here. If he's Monday paid money, he may be in the room. Oh, right. <laughs> well, but Bill, I was going what I did see. with Bill, Bill didn't like the Arbors because Beck was always been walking out, you see, in the, those early days, pre-my days. And he didn't like Jimmy, he was a bit, well, no, he didn't, it's not that he didn't like Jimmy, he was wary of Jimmy because Jimmy, Jimmy he's, you know, the, Jimmy doesn't use a broadsword, he's a rapier man. And Bill was a little wary, verbally, of Jimmy. And I played him four tracks off an acetate. And he said, oh, well, that's the first record. Of oh, the first Zeppelin one, you know. I played him four tracks and he thought, I mean, just a, this is the best thing I've heard. I can't remember what I've heard anything better than this. You got it. I mean, and he really, I mean, he really went to bat. For Zeppelin, exactly. not only Zeppelin, in New York. For instance, when you played the Fillmore East on a Saturday and Sunday, it's you and your band, you had to open, and you only ever had two bands on. And the one weekend I wanted to do was Iron Butterfly. Because, I mean, to be honest with you, I knew they could now buy Iron Butterfly's arse well and truly to the ground. <laughs> and I knew that I could score big points off of that. And I've got to give goodies to you. I said, I'm not going to open. Oh, what do you mean? You got it. And I said to him, come on, you love the records, you know how good, and Jimmy and uh, everything. And uh, and what he did was, he put uh, had three acts on, he put Delaney and Bonnie on as the opening act. So you were in the middle? We were in the middle. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Which was great for Zeppelin. Mm. Fantastic. And they nailed on both the They did. I mean, they were, they were still going Zeppelin, Zeppelin, Zeppelin. Mm. I mean, halfway through their set, they were still standing with the Zeppelin. Which is just what I wanted. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, when a band hires you, you have to do your best for them. I mean, over the next ten years from that point, you you, you rode the roller coaster. I mean, you truly did ride the roller coaster, didn't you? It was a well, yes, I guess. Well, well because I decided that we would do it exactly whatever it was. It had to be the best for the band. You did it your way. Did it my way. Yes, yeah. Very interesting. In '77. <coughs> Jimmy was doing a, an interview on, uh, I forget the station in New York, and I was listening in the Plaza Hotel, listening, and I wanted to listen to what the interview, and the DJ said that, uh, uh, well, we're having this studio this afternoon, and we want to welcome superstar Axeman, and all that sort of dialogue, and all that, Mr. Jimmy Page. And he starts going into, uh, into Jimmy, and uh, very pleasant, and then he starts turning around, and the DJ saying, uh, wouldn't you say really, Jimmy, that you, together with your manager, Peter Grant, bulldozed your way through this business and uh, Grant rode rough shot over everybody? And wouldn't you be true to say really, Jimmy, that Led Zeppelin was one great big high? There's a little pose, and Jimmy said, that's right. I mean, you, you, you've obviously got a, a, a reputation which precedes you, and I, I know that the truth is in your face and your pussy can fix it, but this whole thing about I mean, you really went to bat for your act, didn't you? That was the philosophy of it. Was there anything you wouldn't do that was legal? No. Or anything you wouldn't do? <laughs> I'd do whatever I had to do. Hmm. Whatever was necessary. <laughs> Some of this business about... Um, this is where we get into dangerous <laughs> This bit is drop over there. Right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to landing on my head. Um, I thought you always landed on your feet with your bones. <laughs> yeah, so far. Touch marble. Um, the, um, yeah, there's that sequence in Song Remains the Same, which has become sort of very famous, where you're bawling out the, the, the dodgy merchandise. Right. Uh, and I know that, you know, people say, oh, yeah, it's very heavy and all the rest of it, and it, it But the one thing that wasn't acting, what it was... Well, no, I didn't think it was. <laughs> what, what happened was that um, we'd been talking about making a film for a long time, and we started that tour in Boston, I think, in 73. And uh, so what are you going to do? We better get some people over. And Jimmy uh, knew Joe Masso quite well, who'd done some things with George Harrison Wilson. And, brought over. and that scene is actually filmed in Baltimore, not Madison Square Garden. And uh, a guy called Bob Freeman, the cameraman, oh, just turned up. Now, I wasn't aware of that. And as he happened to come in with his camera, we just caught the guy selling the dodgy posters. And inside like the venue? Inside the venue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's bad enough outside. But... Yeah, no, actually inside the venue. Well, that's and I steamed in and... Uh, I mean, the whole bit is not good, but he see, he tried to deny it and all that at the beginning. And, I mean, it's just as it was, and I did steam into him. Well, what the hell's all that about? Selling places inside the venue? I wasn't going to stand for that. That's what happens in Italy, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. They sell them on the stage in Italy. They can take a picture of the airport, and then they, you know, by the time you get to the venue, they can see the post there. <laughs> Oh, you have to have an autograph when you get to the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, if any of you people ever work Italy, put it on the phone. Um, but that whole thing about that type of attitude, I mean, I said to Alan Rubin yesterday, did he consider he was a man of his time? Do you think that what the way, the style you developed was just necessary? Uh, in the sense that, I mean, you talk, called it an adventure a few minutes ago, and uh, it was all pioneering stuff and stuff. It was. But those of us around now, we've got the benefit of computerised ticketing and... That's right. You know, 
with what digital vibration. Well, I think it was right at that time. <laughs> well, I, I think it was right at that time. Mm. I mean, it seemed to have worked. Mm. Oh, yeah. And it was around for 12 years. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I can see his arms. Um, was it, did you ever get into situ I mean, you told me a very funny story once where you, I think you, you, you did something to somebody. It was reasonably brutal, <laughs> and it sort of backfired on him. I don't know this was. Did you some hole? You some guy was filming something or doing some? Oh, I was banned from uh, from uh, Canada once. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was trying to in Vancouver. Well, Vancouver. You didn't know he was going to get in through immigration, did you? For this? No, no. I told him I was you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I was in there. That's we were doing the. I think it's called the CNP or Canadian Pacific. The PNE. The PNE in Vancouver. Okay, alright, okay. Yeah. And I'm, I'm over by the mixer board and I look down and there's a guy with a sort of thing with dials on it and an aerial in front of the speaker. So I said to one of you, fucking get him out sort of thing. And nobody does. There is no connection. So I went down and challenged the guy and he wouldn't answer me. So I got hold of him and the piece of equipment, took him backstage and threw the uh, piece of equipment down the, uh, uh, down the stairs, uh, which he was about to follow. <laughs> and the whole, the whole assistant old manager came off and all that, and it turned out he was the environmental health man. <laughs> a death pool reader and all that. And uh, the promoter said, said, you're going to get arrested. I said, not me. And when we finished, we were into the car, and we went straight to Starship, and he got on to Starship and went to, flew to Seattle. Because you and I do have, have, have something in common. We've both been arrested mm. several times, I think. <laughs> in my case, entirely in Italy. But, uh... <laughs> no, I've to, over here twice, once in New Orleans with Bay Company. And uh, they threw us in the slammer there. And in New York, I did in the film, which is boring. Boring? After the robbery. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Mm. yeah. But yeah, within all, in the middle of all this, I mean, Zeppelin's going on and you're going from level to level to level, yes. and, and of course you start Swan Song. Yes, in 74. And well, I mean, in 72, um, I had dinner with Armin one night, and the third album was coming, about to come out, and I said to Armin, um, I said, it's funny how time flies by. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we carry on eating, and he, he's, I've now understood that he's thinking, what is he talking about, he said. <laughs> and uh, this goes down about, the, and I go on the theme of time flies by for the whole of the dinner. You know, time flies by. There was a fancy army, which is God bless him now. He walks right into it, doesn't he? Army says, well, what did she do mean by time flies by? I said, well, I said, we're about to deliver the third album. And we'll only owe you two albums then. And he went, you fucker. And he was trying to wait and said, you wouldn't do that to me. Now he's trying to do what I've done on him by saying, you wouldn't do that to me. Affecting me to say, what do you mean? But I knew what he meant. He meant, would I walk after the next two albums? And when we were on our way back in, the, in his limo and all that, and he said, can we talk about it? And I said, yeah, sure we can. Mm -hmm. And we extended the deal, what I extended the deal. And I've got to tell you, the difference between, not what I hear here, and you tell me, but other managers, he knows that he was, I was dealing with Armin. We used to shake hands on the deals. When we, I used to up the deal and backdate it, and we probably wouldn't do the paperwork for another year. But the next quarter's check came, and that increased royalty was there. I mean, it might interest you. Know, but yeah. going on, at that time, we, I did talk to him about a label. And it wasn't a label, it was a label where we could, like, give what I gained, like fixed packaging and productions and things like that. And artistic thing, if we could bring other artists. He wanted me to bring other artists to Atlantic, you know. And I said, well, you know, if we had a label, I would think about doing it. So you, and he you started some song, which went yeah. through Atlantic? Yeah, went through Atlantic <coughs> in 74. Yeah, and sort of Absolutely. let you go and Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And Absolutely. you had Ryan Harper on no, no, we didn't have Ryan, we didn't have Ryan. Yeah. No, what he did was, uh, what we did, they had an over, yeah, we got to Maggie Bell. What we did was, no, uh, Bad Company were on Ireland. He wanted them to be on Ireland. Yeah. 
but also there were some songs like Can't Get Enough Your Love was one of them that when Mick was in what Mick wrote it, when he was in what the hoop we in Hunter wouldn't record it and I said to Chris this is outrageous because what was the name of the guy who ran, ran on and publishing Lionel or somebody Conway 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 thank you, Conway, thank you. I went to Chris, I said, Lionel Conway's had this laying on the shelf, gathering dust for two and a half, three years. I said, you don't deserve to be the publisher. And I shamed it out of him, and he had to give us the publishing. <laughs> I shamed it out of him. <laughs> you want to Maybe because he didn't want me to go and tell the whole business what belonged to Lionel Conway was. <laughs> <laughs> so that became a bad company. Right. Yeah, and you want to tell me that, that you considered that Swan Song was, was probably a mistake? With yeah, it was, without doubt. Because? Because when you're a manager, and I was managing Zeppelin, which was a 24-hour day job, and, and bad company, and I'm not good at delegating things to people, and I picked the wrong people, and it was just too much to do. Yeah. That was a mistake. It's like I was saying in the panel we were doing about empire building. Absolutely, and I never wanted to be an empire builder, but leave that to, you know, we'll for the stickers and that. It was just too much. Yeah. Had maybe we got the right people in at the beginning to run it, it might have been all right, but it was yeah. it was the mistake it was the mistake I made. I made a mistake that I think that I could cope. You know, I see I should have done I knew what match when Queen came to see me and asked me to manage them in seventy five and I had two or three meetings with Queen and I still remain friends with the Brian May to this day. And I said to them, fellas, I cannot do it because I'm managing two bands already and there's, there's only so much I can do and I don't want to ever be in a position where I've got to let somebody down. Yeah. I said, and that's why I can't do it. And I think they wrote some money from Trident Studios. They wrote 125 grand. I made a few calls and helped them get their money, but I didn't take. I didn't take them because it wouldn't be. You can't be an empire. No, no. I wish I'd said the same thing to Brian Ferry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> now you, of course, Zeppelin came to an end for a very tragic reason. And uh, I mean, in our profession, I can't imagine anything worse happening. And. Um, I know that part something else, you lost a, a very dear friend. And you went into what you've, you've, you've called your sort of dark period, or black period after that. I did in the yes. And, and the, the chemicals were... Oh, uh, listen, the Peruvian, the Peruvian economy rocketed. Believe <laughs> <laughs> me. The marching powder got severe, severely, yes, very much so. And this went on for some years, didn't it? I mean, it did, it did. I mean, I got to the point when I just couldn't face the phone calls. Right. Yeah. I could, no, I couldn't. I couldn't. No. The bad company had already said they wanted to make solo albums and do what they wanted to do. And I had so many fellas and that's what we were going to do it. You know. So you sort of more or less shut up shop up? I did, yeah. Like that. I did, yes. And I know there was the announcement. I mean, I think everybody, all, all, all four of you... Didn't but Improving Park came after that, so it was of 82 period. 83 period. Well, 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 were you as, were I you mean, uh, at this point? I was, um, you know, it was like, you know, everybody was phoning, people, people, drummers were phoning, saying they'd been promised a job, and, you know, was, not army, but some of the people in Atlantic became so big by that time were saying, live album, I said, no live album, and their attitudes, you make it a big mistake, you'd be the big mistake of your life, and all that. And then you end up with Sheldon Vogel. Got it in one. Thank you. And <laughs> so you had some stuff in the can, but you weren't, it wasn't going to come out. And there was this. Uh, no, no, no. Well, uh, yeah, no, well, no, we did Coda. We did Coda. That was before. Coda was that last album of Zeppelin. And I made a deal with Armit. Uh, and we actually we, we did, we spoke to Pat, which is John's yeah. widow, mm -hmm. and said we'd like to do this album. It was three of us from Jones and Robert. Yeah, we met, you know, um, in uh, and Jimmy, we met and said we'd like to do this album. And I made a deal with Arm, which I can't imagine you could do nowadays. I said, look, we may or we may not have a start because what we wouldn't do is add another drummer. And Jimmy wasn't sure whether we quite got enough stuff. 
And we made, I made a deal which we got one of the biggest, you know, like Sons and Rods is at that time, you know, and we, we got that together and that went out. And I made Robert his solo deal, you know, and then after that, then, then it came on me, I just, yeah, I just shut myself up. I shut myself away in my house. And you've been laying more or less in your house, was it yeah. four years? That's part of four years, yes, yeah. I do. And at this point, you, you had a drug problem? Yeah. It, yeah. Peru, Peru was doing well, but you weren't yes. doing quite so well. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. But I got out of it, and I got out of it, and without even going to a clinic. What I did one day, I had was a call to buy the bed, and I stayed in bed for three days and drank like flagons of fresh fruit orange juice. And I went and I threw it down the toilet and I've never been near it ever since. And I passed it on. Because there's something else about Peter which... And my mind has said, you thought we would have got a refund on that. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's something else then about it with you which I think is, is interesting to me. Uh, that you brought your two children up as a single parent, didn't you? I did, yeah. And my light wife left me 76. They were 9 and 10, yeah, and I did bring them up on my own, yeah. They wouldn't leave, would they? Would they? No, they wouldn't leave. They said, Dad's... That's worked hard and we're not going and they stayed with me. Mm. And you've met my children. Oh, yeah. Well, and, sure. and my grandchildren. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, you're, you're... So, you pre- so when this was all over and you've, you've, you've kicked the habit and the rest of it, you've basically been retired since then. Yes. Yes. Mm. Living in sunny Eastbourne, That's which right. for our Canadian friends is a, a seaside resort in South London. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know the sort of desires to no. get back into it. Mm. Yeah. Find some dodgy poor people. I mean, I miss it. Sometimes I really miss it. I think, but, but I tell you what, I miss it. Funny, and it involves you. When I went to Spain for the end of the Dire Straits tour, mm-hmm. and it was that place, I mean, I was 18, 19,000, or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, it was it's where those houses try to go out, and there's that rush. It's 20,000. I mean, one, one of the three. biggest thrills of managing Led Zeppelin was 8 o'clock. They always went on yeah, 8 o'clock. Yeah. When those house lights went out, and you've got that. Before they even played the note, that energy rush from the audience. You can smell the audience, I would say. You know. I think that you, when you go into it, when you, I, I get this thing when you're driving up to the venue, and you see it, you know, coming up to the mm. Mary Lee Gardens or whatever, and you start mm. getting that adrenaline thing. Yeah, certain buildings are like that. The Forum in LA is yeah. like that, it's like that vast spaceship, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, the Meadowlands in New Jersey is like that. Mm. But, the, but the thing where you're driving up to the gig, and, and and you go in and you come into the backstage area and you can hear the sound of the audience and you can sm- there's an act- there's a smell especially in San Diego <laughs> we've got a lot of bad feet down there but, so so uh, yeah I mean I know you came out and you, you, you I put Peter up on the stage and uh, you did a couple of hours of stand up um, <laughs> but yeah I know you enjoyed that a lot yeah you? very much so very much think. but you know desire to get back into it okay, so when you look at the industry now any thoughts about the way it's gone? Would you ever imagine that we'd be all going to conferences? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed when I've been to see uh, like Bon Jovi. Um, I used to do some things with Richie Sambore, but he was with Swan Song on the publishing side. Mm. And uh, about three years ago, he invited me up to Milton Keynes, which is a big outdoor. Yeah, it's like a, an amphitheater, shed, an amphitheater like, yeah. yeah. Then I went out, I took a helicopter up there, you know, and uh, one of this was all these people that, what they hear as Lucy Turner's suits. People worrying about how much of merchandise will take it, you know. I mean, I've never seen so many people with sort of like polyglots or whatever it is hanging on them. Mm, polyglots. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, you know, I noticed that. I don't think there must, could be so much fun now, though. But there isn't. I mean, that's the thing to me is that the thing that's really gone out of it to a lot of extent. And everything I've heard, when I've come to those, uh, the uh, IMF meetings, you know, in England, you know, and you listen to all those panels which I've come to listen to, you know, and it's all the same, I mean, the way record comes, I mean, it's totally gone. I mean, in my day, when I started, you know, Atlantic were there to help nurture the artist, you know, what can we do, and they would never do... You know, they would show you we are doing this, a flyer and all this is what we're thinking of doing. 
and in charity, you know, the art work and things like that. You know, and they were all there. I mean, I guess I was really lucky like, because I mean, no one went. It was a, it was a proper record of that. Mm. We should don't well, you look at like the guys who are in, the, the people, well, lots of women in it now as well, thankfully, but people yeah. in management, you think of the sort of the way that managers operate these days. Well, I suppose they, they have to operate according to why it's gone, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you think that the, I mean, that the, you came from an era where there were certain sort of larger than life characters. Yes. Colonel Parker's one, I can think of. Yes. Uh, himself and, you know, and uh, I mean in, in, the, in his role as a manager Bill Graham is somebody who springs to mind as well so Absolutely. But we don't seem to have well, Bill Graham was more than a promoter was an impresario and Bill Graham I think he knew music yeah yes and he understood yeah. theatre as well and he understood yeah he understood he understood but we seem to there seem to be less characters about it's the, the characters, characters to, uh, who make yeah. it interesting to me yeah. yeah you know I mean who's going to write a book about the 90s <laughs> There's nothing to write, isn't there? Well, of course it won't be a book, it won't be on, it'll be on a disc. <laughs> <laughs> or down a fiber optic. Yeah, yeah. Beeping up your trouser leg. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think, I should think that something I noticed now, though, I and mean, we always took great trouble with our covers. There was something about picking a record up. Well, the cover of the is square, then. Yeah, you know, now those CDs, I mean, I can't even read those things. And so, those things are a bit of pain. Which seems to be worse and worse. Yeah, if you've got arthritis, you don't open them. <laughs> 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 uh, let's take a few questions from the floor, because we're, we're running a little bit late here. And immediately pop, pop up, pop the gentleman there. I hope you're a male. Yes. I'm, I'm curious about uh, what Peter's feelings may be about the notion of retiring gracefully from uh, a musician's <laughs> point of view, uh, just looking at uh, bands like Jeff Rotel and the Moody Blues that at the peak of their form in the 70s were playing arenas around the world and are coming back playing anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500 people. I'm wondering if, if you feel any sort of uh, sadness at that notion. I, I have mixed emotions about it. On the other hand, I think, well, if, if that's what they want to do and if they get as much enjoyment out of it as ever, who are we to sort of deny? Well, I can see very much at the hotel, but I thought it was a bit sad. I thought the Who could only have done that thing for money. I mean, the Who, you know, without Keith Moon, wasn't the Who really, was it? For me. 